scorn scorn Miracle is such a loaded word. By definition, it means an event that cannot be explained by logic or science that came about because of divine intervention. Calling this match the Brighton Miracle suggests it came down to the hand of God, which is impossible because Alan Wynne Jones was in Cardiff to play Uruguay the following day. When, in fact, every beat of this match was explainable by logic and science. And I'm going to prove that right now by breaking down every beat of the match and explaining it by logic and science. Because, as I've already explained in the previous part that you've hopefully watched, but, you know, if not, it's fine. I, 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 it's up to you. you know, I won't judge you. Japan had got themselves into a place in which they had the self-confidence, belief, ability, and drive to go out and do what most thought impossible, to beat the Springboks. And it's visible right from the beginning that this team is different to the Japan sides we've seen in the past. Before this World Cup, Captain Michael Leach spoke publicly of how sick he was of playing in Japan teams who accept a defeat, where players would give up when they miss a tackle and lost hope when they went one try down. Eddie Jones might have been the mastermind, he might have been the man plotting the path, but it was Leach driving standards on a day-to-day, minute-to-minute basis. And this was just as Eddie wanted. The moment that first whistle goes, Japan are his team no more. They now belong to Michael Leach. And Leach's message is received loud and clear. The clearance from the kickoff by Goromaru allows Kirshner, Habana and Berger, two of which are 50 cap World Cup winners, to counterattack. However, despite missing the initial tackle, Mashashima works hard to catch Habana and tighthead Hatakiyama covers 20 yards to get back. But most importantly, the Japanese line is set better than the spring box. The box of this era would normally interlink forwards and backs in a kind of precursor to the one structure, but there's no such balance to the wide men here. It's just the backs lined up in sequence. Flyoff Ono makes a solid tackle, but just look at the picture as he does so. Creel's only support is a lightweight winger in Vovo and the world's most suave wildebeest, Victor Matfield, who's ahead of the play and has to check himself before he can enter the breakdown from the correct side. Japan, on the other hand, have men spare. They've got loads of them, meaning they can afford for Sente Male Sao to enter and pinch the ball. Japan, ever in character, decide to make a statement and run the ball out from their own line. Most of the work is done by the forwards. Hooker shot a Horier making the ground to take them up to halfway. And from South Africa's second attack, merely a, you know, a minute or so later, Japan do exactly the same. Now, a typical battle at the breakdown, especially in 2015, an era dominated by sevens built like McCaw, Pocock and Warburton, is a case of smash, bash and crash. It's an area in which Goliath would leave David with his arm in a very different kind of sling. So Japan look, as ever, to use the disadvantage of their size to their advantage, getting in extremely low and extremely fast. Broadhurst has owned in on the ball before Ontario has even hit the deck, whilst the cry of BEAST is still on the vowels, leading Ontario, likely subconsciously, loosening his grip, as this is the part where normally he presents the ball back for one of his own teammates. Broadhurst takes advantage. There's no hanging about and trying to win a penalty. He just pinches a ball and leaves, like a doctor with a lot of testicular cancer tests to do. Flyhalf Cosayono sprints in the moment he notices a turnover, just in case there's a chance to play quickly. There isn't. So instead, Goromaru calmly slots into the pocket and clears. And from the box third attack, Japan survive again, and it eventually results in this scrum, giving the Blossoms their first real attack of the game. Now, prior to the World Cup, when asked how Japan would play, Eddie Jones said his side would be more reliant on passing around the opposition to cross the game line, mate, because their smaller size meant they couldn't just crash over it, mate. The natural assumption here is that Japan would play like the All Blacks or Argentina did in this World Cup, the two sides who statistically did pass the most often. Both played with incredible pace and width. Argentina's forwards passed more than any other teams, whilst that year's All Blacks lobbed it wide so often their centres and outside backs threw almost the same number of passes their scrum halves over the full tournament. They were sides built to spread the ball around. They passed a lot, and it resulted in incredibly attractive rugby, like like this and this and that. They, they, they were really, really fun to watch, and they looked like this. They did lots of passing. This was not how Japan played at all. In fact, Japan threw fewer total passes in that match than South Africa and finished the tournament mid-table on the passing stat charts. And yet, what Jones said was not inaccurate or misleading at all. Japan did pass around their opposition, just they did it off 9 instead 10 as per the All Blacks or Pumas. Let's look at this try from their final pool game against the USA, eventually finished by Yoshi Fujita. After regathering the ball, Japan worked 11 phases across 67 seconds. That's an average of one new phase, one new ruck, every six seconds. The average in this World Cup was one new ruck every 12 seconds in possession. Japan are working twice as hard as any other team. They're going through twice as many phases, except only two times across those 11 phases 
Does anyone other than Fumi Tanaka, the scrum half, pass? First of these three phases, Fumi has four men he can pass to, and he selects centre wing. Where's Len? Centre. His name's Wing. It's one pass, but Jones wasn't lying. Japan have still passed around five USA defenders here. Previously in Eddie Jones' time as Japan coach, his side did try and pass around an opposition from 10, throwing several many passes, but he clearly worked out ahead of the World Cup. This was a waste. They'd only really throw multiple passes if they sensed it was a proper opportunity. The most important part of this new Japanese style of rugby was pace, not passing. You tire an opposition and catch them off guard. You disorganise them. You hit their key defenders. There's no need for a fly half to be a middleman when Fumi can put people in space himself. As such, Japan topped three very noticeable, very important stats at this World Cup. The most phases, the shortest time between phases, and the most passes from the scrum half. In the Brighton match, Tanaka, or his replacement Hawasa, made an astonishing 62% of Japan's total passes. Jones had essentially transformed very standard one-up rugby into a thrilling, pacey new strategy. Their kicking game also played into this. Whereas most teams would target space or zones of the field, Japan would aim instead for specific individual players. This is because kicking was a calculation. As Jones learned after that first year in charge, if you're never kicking, you actually become far easier to defend. Knowing you're keeping in hand, the opposition have no need to cover the backfield, so can instead just choke you with a 40-man line. And having done the homework, the Springboks started the match with a very light backfield, prepared for whatever this new Japanese style of rugby bullshit would be. It might sound odd, but Japan only kicked so that they could keep the ball in hand. This grubber by Goromaru early on succeeds in putting Zane Kirshner under the most pressure he'll face until someone finally asks him about his continued commitment to the chin strap. But really, it's to try and encourage Brian Habana to hang back in this zone in future, to cover the space the kick finds. And likewise, this stab through by Tatakawa is to encourage the scrum after sweeping closer behind. And it works! Before the first half is over, South Africa have adapted the defence and are consistently dropping three or four men back out of the main line, granting Japan so much more space to attack. Japan kicked the second least of any team in this World Cup. Against Scotland, they only booted the ball six, six times, which I believe is a World Cup record low. But when they did, they made it count. The other key is just how organised Japan were. Memories of this team are that they often ran things at a million miles an hour, playing wide to wide with the kind of aggressive yet wiggly dynamism of a cobra that just swallowed every power-up from Mario Kart. And yet, a lot of their play was far more standard than we remember. They were quite happy to set, wait and press, to keep calm. Look at this. After the team begins to lose their shape, Japan deliberately set a phase using only backs, meaning the forwards can set up again across the pitch, with their team only losing a winger and one of several distributors, they've got plenty of those. And it works! Most teams would require two or three solid carries to refine the kind of shape Japan can manage almost immediately. Now with all that in mind, let's go back to this scrum. Remember, remember the scrum? Yeah, so it's become more common nowadays, but right from his time at the Brumbies in Australia, Eddie Jones has always been the champion of the free phase move. The idea is simple and logical. As per those two tries I mentioned against Wales from last week's video, the first two phases are to shut down or manipulate key parts of the defence, meaning they can then expose a weakness on phase three. It's like the first two are to incapacitate an opponent's arms, so the team can then successfully sock them in the stomach third time round. Here, knowing the Springboks will be expecting something fancy from Japan after you know this start where they run it from their own trial line, the Blossoms play two passes into Haramuchi Tatakawa, who, for the ease of comparison, I'm just going to ask you to imagine as the Japanese Owen Farrell, you know, a big, solid, but classy distributor who's equally comfortable at 10 or 12. He then dummies the loop back to Kaseyono, but instead he crashes right over the top of Pat Lambie, but close enough to tie in Jean de Villiers. This takes care of the left arm. This Bok team pressed from the 12 channel to Villiers and are no longer able to do so, and it leaves Jesse Creel calling and clapping for cover. So his pack help him out. Low, Berg and de Villiers fade wide to cover the space, assuming that's where Japan are heading next. Except the plan is built on the assumption that the box will work hard to cover this wide space, especially as Japan's own forwards are taking that shape themselves. So number eight Hendrik Tui picks and goes. The box have not considered Japan might keep it tight. The tackle is made, but knowing it was coming, Broadhurst and Thompson are in right away to win the ball back for Japan, granting Fumi incredible incredibly fast ball against the defence, missing both its arms. Because the speed of Tui's carry didn't allow South Africa any time to readjust from their initial overfold. Their strongest defenders, both centres, both locks, the entire back row and Brian Habana, are all on this side of the pitch. The side Japan have no intention of ever attacking, 
because Japan have had two incredibly quick carries well over the game line. The Springbok front row have had no time to do anything since the scrum, but to just kind of jog back roughly in line with that scrum. This leaves South Africa's three slowest players in their defensive line with only Lambie, likely the box weakest tackler, offering any kind of support. Michael Leach picks a line to fix Yanni Duplessis, and this allows Tanaka to target the beast. Spotting the overlap, Bismarck Duplessis drifts a bit to cover it, but it allows Tanaka to unleash Goromaru, who makes the most basic of side steps and goes right through the gap. But where South Africa's front row not being able to cover the ground was a problem. Japan have once again used a potential weakness, the fact their front row will be trapped on this side of the pitch, to their advantage. Taihead Hatakiyama is already in that zone of the pitch and therefore able to basically just trundle in a straight line to secure the ball and keep it incredibly quick. Albeit after Michael Leach has made a brilliant but tot totally illegal clear out. The, the thing is, right, everything about Japan is so fast that even when they cheat, there's no real chance the referee will notice it. He's too busy noticing that the entire South African line weren't able to get back in time and hence were offside. Goromaru slots the resulting penalty and Japan take an early lead. And they use this sheer tempo to catch South Africa offside again just minutes later, as a quick tap by Tanaka allows Japan to once again attack the box front five, the easiest players to tire. The ever glorious shot of Horie throws this mad shit past Amale Sao, who takes it into contact. However, Tanaka waits until Japan has set fully, just as Ono waits until Berger has made a decision on who he's going to tackle before doing anything. This allows the fly half to drop off a pass to Thompson instead to make a very significant carry, and once again, guarantee quick ball. Tanaka ever alert then passes to Horie simply because his opposite man was stood offside. This wins Japan another penalty and allows Goromaru a second shot at goal. However, perhaps the most important moment of that first half had nothing to do with pace. After the box score a try through uh, the bloke from Parks and Rec in the West Wing. Roblo, Japan get downfield and do literally the same thing. Rugby World Cups have thrown up plenty of well-prepared novelty acts, you know, tier two teams who have a fun thing that they brought to rugby, like be it Fiji's offloading, Samoa's bone breaking, George's monstrous scrummaging, but the only help them push, never beat, teams not called Wales or France. Japan scoring from a maul against the best mauling team on the planet was a statement. Anything you can do, we can do pr pretty much as well, as effectively, if not as well, by being smart about it and piling backs and using really low body positions to make the most of our weight. These low body positions were hugely important in the scrum, I'm assured, but I wouldn't really understand. But the rest of their forward play was often far more fancy. South Africa were maybe the best set-piece team in the competition, and to ensure they won the ball, Japan played a huge number of actually very simple but fun tricks. The Blossoms had three throw-ins right down in the opposition corner on the 5 meter line, and two of them they just throw to a man at the front before the spring box have set, whilst Matt Field and Co are still trying to crack the code. But on the third, in the 79th minute, they call it to Michael Broadhurst at the tail. The only line out Broadhurst took all game, meaning the box will have presumably assumed he isn't a jumping option. He isn't taking it, we don't have to watch him. However, even when throwing their regular jumpers, they kept it tricksy. Here, veteran Lock Hitashiono is dawdling at the back. He's not an option at all. Their main line out receiver, Luke Thompson, who I'm going to get onto in a minute, is waiting to lift Broadhurst here, with both Diego and Matt Field noticing, watching him. They're looking at him, kind of expecting something sneaky. They think Thompson's going up in the air. They were half right. Thompson is a trick, but he's not the jumper. He's the lifter. Just not lifting the man they expect. Tui, stood in at scrum half, runs round as the ball comes in to lift Ono from behind, allowing the Blossoms to secure the ball safely. Broadhurst then slides out from the receiver position into play nine, delivering a simple pass on to the other Ono. This kind of ingenuity will see Japan scramble and survive every piece of phase play the box put in over the first half without conceding a try, all the green points instead coming from their maul. Most impressive being the turnover at the end of the half, the result of two tackles in a row by a man named Luke Thompson. Now, my memory of this game from around the time was that Goromaru, Leach and Fumi Tanaka, the big stars, stepped up to the plate. They had fantastic, fantastic games. And they did. But watching it back for this video, something became immediately and incredibly clear to me. Something I never noticed at the time. The best player on the pitch 
was Luke Thompson. Thompson is often talked about as a journeyman who only got picked by Japan because they had no other line options. But in reality, Luke Thompson is a guy who poured his heart and soul into not just the Japan jersey, but the nation and his local community, and to my mind, should be considered one of the most underrated players of the last 20 years. I'd argue only Alan Wynne Jones has personified the evolution of the second row position over the course of his career as well as Thompson. Both of them playing in four World Cups and both of them have updated their game consistently to reflect whatever was expected of a lock at the time. Working with then forwards coach Steve Borthwick, Thompson was crucial in making sure the Japanese set piece worked. They didn't look to dominate, though they did actually manage to do that a few times, but they looked to be consistent, solid. Their game relied on possession, they need to be able to secure that. However, it was around the park that Thompson really showed himself. Luke Thompson was second only to his captain for tackles made with 13, including key hits such as this, and was seemingly there to clear out every single break, every single breakdown? You can't play with pace unless you're winning the ball quickly, and Thompson allowed Japan to control their own tempo. However, in 2015, a set-piece oriented second row was essentially a disposable body in attack. Clearing out the number of rocks Thompson was doing wasn't that remarkable, because it would have been his sole job for most teams. But Eddie Jones knew better than to waste a play with Thompson's rugby intelligence on menial tasks. Now we'll get onto his kind of flashier contributions later on, but his disposable carrying was consistently excellent. If Japan were going nowhere, he would so often be the man to take it in, allowing Leach, Sao, Tui and later Maffey to only carry when they'd be an asset, when they'd move Japan forwards instead of stopping them going backwards. If it was a thankless task, it went to Luke Thompson, and he took them all on with a plum. And indeed, Japan's second try comes from Thompson securing a turnover in his own half, then winning the line-out incredibly cleanly, despite competition in the air from Victor Matfield, maybe the best line-out operator of all time. And speaking of all time, this is a try that will be remembered for so long as rugby has played. It's a perfect encapsulation of the Eddie Jones Japan. Brilliant, precise, practised, and yet so bold, because none of this was as they'd rehearsed. A few minutes earlier, Adrian Strauss had made like his political lookalike and barreled over defenders who appeared to be Japanese school children. These scores tend to happen in the last 15 minutes of a tier 1 v tier 2 game, even the ones where the smaller side really fronts up. But what doesn't tend to happen is the tier 2 nation scoring in return. And so, when given the ball in the opposition half, Japan know it's now or never. They have to pull something special. And by any definition, this move is special. However, for years, I think a lot of people have missed just how bold it was as well. Because this move was not designed to be played off a line-out. This move is designed to be played off a scrum. But knowing it's the best move they have, and the most crucial moment of the entire four-year cycle, of Jones' entire Japan tenure, the Blossoms pull it anyway. They call a full eight-man line-out to try and best replicate the scrum conditions, but... From a set scrum, Khaleesi, Dupree and Usenhazen would not be able to work around and close as much space as they can here. Japan's play is designed to target and pick off individual Springbok defenders, and because it'd only be the backs off a scrum, they've each got to cover so much more space. But by calling it off a line-out, they risk allowing the box to crab across and shut down the move. It only takes one correct tackle for the whole thing to be blown. But who's to know if the Blossoms will have a scrum on this touchline with just 12 minutes to go? In a standard situation off a scrum, the eight would pick up and deliver past the scrum half. This was a regular ploy of Jones' Japan to create an extra attacker. The ball comes out so quickly, the opposition can't bring the scrum half round from the blind side as fast as Japan can move their nine into the opposing fly half channel, creating an extra man. It allows one half back to thread the most difficult pass, whilst the other remains available for future tricksy antics. Off a scrum, the move would look a bit like this. 8 to 9, 9 to 10, both centres run dummy lines, 10 back inside to the blind side wing. However, because it's a line-out, the first pass has to be whipped away quickly enough to prevent a further defensive drift, and so Hawassa, the scrum half, and hence best passer on the field, is given that job. This means Japan have to adapt the move on the fly. Centre Tatakawa slots into what would have been the 9's role, throwing the second pass. This is a moment of pure fortune. When the teams were named, ball carrier Craig Wing was due to start at 12. Wing was a good player, but Tatakawa was more of a distributor, having played many of Eddie's tests at 10. And this cleaner playmaking axis allows Japan to improvise a little bit more. However, Tatakawa has also been carrying flat all game, filling Wing's role. And a flat ball into him from 9 could easily be a simple crash-up job. They've been doing it all day. So the trio of floating defenders adjust their run ever so slightly. They need to help support their fly half from the tackle. Tatakawa's primary job is to fix Pollard, and he's aided by a great dummy line by centre partner Sal. Pollard opts for Tatakawa, coming in and making the shot, but 
Playing off a lineout means Japan are one dummy runner down on the usual plan, so Sao is having to attract the attention of both Pollard and box captain Jean de Villiers. Now, Jean de Villiers is famous for being one of the best readers of an opposition midfield of all time. So he realises Marley Sao is a dummy runner. He realises he can ignore him, he can look away from that space and readjust to help out Jesse Creel stood outside him. Tatakawa, however, gives it to Koseyono, the fly half, who flicks it back on the inside to Mashashima, who is targeting exactly the same space Sao was. The move is a double bluff. Eddie Jones built a game plan on turning weaknesses into strengths, but the coup de resistance here is turning one of the Springbok's biggest strengths, de Villiers' ability to read the game, into a weakness. De Villiers reads the play, knows he can ignore this space here, and in Japan send a second man straight into it. Ono's line deliberately targets Creel, and Mashishima hides himself behind the other Japanese backs until he's taking the pass. He then does phenomenally. He hits the hole, straightens back up, meaning Kirshner has to turn his hips slightly, and hence can't drift to cover the support Japan have deliberately designed to flood outside him. Frankly, this move seems designed on the assumption it won't go this cleanly, with Triscoll Goromaru being supported in turn by wing Akihito Yamada, himself a brilliant finisher. However, Goromaru finishes it, then nails a conversion, and boy oh boy is this a game. However, the contrasting management of these last 10 minutes is fascinating. Scores level, the box proceed to press, and almost cross the line a few times. Andre Pollard makes a great break, but Leach's words about not giving up on lost causes must be ringing in Mashashima's ears after his miss on Strauss, and he makes a superb cover tackle. Then Yamada kills a follow-up attack by shooting up offside. It's a penalty, sure, but he gets just enough in Foy Dupree's eye line that he doesn't risk the pass, and it allows Japan to scramble back and get a full defence out. However, the Blossoms remain brave in all sense of the word. Here, Michael Leach chooses to leave his own posts undefended to track across the pitch, and the Blossoms continuously stop box bigger than them from an inch or so short. Each time I watch this bit, it looks like it's just a matter of time until South Africa score. However, from that Yamada penalty, Captain de Villiers opts to take the points. Despite pressing to such a degree, you suspect they could have killed the game if they just kept playing. He takes a shot, and even if they don't score, Japan still have 100 metres to go to the goal line, and their exits have typically landed them around the 22 metre line. It's a lot of pressure for a team who've never been in this situation to withstand. Now, there's a parallel world in which Japan win this with a 100 meter try and we're lambasting De Villiers for not taking the points, but perhaps in hindsight of what happened a few minutes later, it kind of does feel like a lazy decision. To use the old cliche, it's the decision of a team trying not to lose rather than a team trying to win. Japan, on the other hand, take the second option. In what has become a staple of Eddie Jones' England, they kick long in the hope the opposition will kick back to them. This is all set up to counterattack. Only Yamada and Leach really chase the kickoff, and just Inagaki, a prop, attempts to put any pressure on Pollard's clearance, several Japan forwards already jogging back before Pollard's even caught the ball. Goromo looks up, deliberately looks to set up a ruck as centrally as possible, with Thompson, obviously, having worked back and being there to make a brilliant clear out and secure possession. Because of how the box set up their kick receipt, targeting the centre of the field means Japan have successfully separated the South African defence into backs on one side and forwards on the other. Hiwasa just dances in the defence's eye line. The backs are watching this pod of forwards before Mashashima comes from behind it to hit a very good line at pace. Whilst he's mostly on his own, he's targeting the area in which South Africa have no breakdown threats, nobody there to even slow their ball down, and Hawasa is able to get there before any box have got back. This allows Thompson to assess his options then make a great carry. They lose the ball a couple of phases later, but this was only a teaser for what Japan had to come. After a great kick and chase by Pollard and Peterson, which would be great name for a detective agency, Dupria spots some more space and tries to catch Japan off guard, but Goromari is smart to it. He not only covers the space, but here's Yamada call it. The Bok defence, chasing a second kick in a row, is up narrow, and Yamada is able to expertly fix Etzebeth and allow Tatakawa a run. He bounces to Villiers, who has a lot of ground to cover to get into position. Once Tatagal goes to ground, Japan innovate. They set a standard shape, a pod of forwards, with a distributor at the back. Except, Luke Thompson changes his run at the last minute, and...
evolves himself into a fly half. The forward is the distributor. This isn't a lock throwing a tip on pass. Luke Thompson here is good as playing fly half. Whilst Maffey can't get the ball out to Leach to use the overlap, Thompson has under pressure in a tight test match made the correct decision and picked the right man. He then piles in behind to help out Maneki Maffey, who also has a, a properly outstanding game off the bench, on for the extra metres. Oh, and then uh, Luke Thompson obviously carries himself the following phase. This is the new Japanese style of rugby coming into effect. The average time between rucks in this World Cup was 12.4 seconds. Japan here get through five in 19 seconds. There's sometimes some debate over whether the best way to tire a pack is the Rob Baxter extra approach of forcing them into making loads and loads of tackles, or what New Zealand and Argentina were doing in forcing them to slide from side to side across the pitch to run lots and lots and lots. Whilst everyone else argued about this, Eddie Jones just worked out a way to do both at once. These five quick carries are about the defence more than they're about the attack. And they once again divide the box into forwards on one side and backs on the other. Tatakawa is the man to spot this. He races around, taking the ball from deep, at pace, throwing the dummy, then thundering into the line for a net gain. I'm sure, the pass is on here, but it comes back to Eddie Jones's principle of decision making. If this ball comes off, it's a try. If it doesn't, it could be game over. So Tatakawa keeps hold of it. Phases like these force the Springbok forwards to work incredibly hard, and Japan are doing almost nothing. Their patterns designed to make each player as efficient as possible. The Japanese 15 cover the entire width of the pitch, but no player without the ball is ever having to really work between phases. They get into shape, the ball comes out, they play a few more phases, then once the shape disintegrates, Fumi or Hawasa slows things down and they refine formation. This is all being dictated very deliberately by the new man on the pitch as 2019 hero Yutomura has now come on and replaced Kosayono at fly half. Tomura has since developed a reputation for his distributory arse as the key that unlocks the defence, but after coming on at 72 minutes for the final 10 where Japan, a passing team, has some 90% of the ball, Tomura does not give one pass nor make one kick. That's not his job as a fly half. This is not the rugby you're used to. This is Eddie Jones's new Japanese style of rugby. And there's no point dirtying the hands of your best rugby mind. When Japan are looking to one of the 38% of passes from players not playing nine, Tomura leaves Tatakawa to do all the dirty work of drop-offs and wide balls. Tomura is there purely to direct. Virtually every play Japan make in his final few minutes, you can see him calling well in advance, usually before the previous player has taken contact. Many of you are probably shrugging and saying, y you know, yeah, obviously, telling your team what to do is part of a fly off's job. Yeah, but in Eddie Jones land, it's not part of a fly off's job. It is the fly off's job. It's the entire job. Kosayono barely kicked, leaving it to Goromaru, and Tomura doesn't pass once, leaving it to Tatakawa. It's like that thing about how we only use a tiny percentage of our brains because so much of them are taken up worrying about eating, wanking, and trying to work out whether the wind will blow your hat off. Jones allowed his best rugby mind to use 100% of it. Tomura's one touch in those final few phases instead is this, identifying a prop, then a step and go. And there's absolutely no ego about it. It's a nice break but you can see he's a cog in a machine. Japan keep working, and they play a repeat of their earlier move with Tatakawa, as winger Yamada picks a good line and really charges between two Springbok defenders. With there being no attackers on this side, the box have obviously left it lighter. However, this carry ties up all four forwards, and only scrum half to Priya and wing Peterson drift to cover the far extreme. So Japan swing round. This appears to have been the plan. They split the defence. A wide ball goes to Broadhurst. They've brought Goromaru and Mashashima round to this side. Broadhurst, one of the biggest carriers, looks to do so, but he flicks the ball inside to Goromaru, who really puts his head down, charges the line. He, he gets so close, he almost makes it. He's taken just short. And Kunius de Hazen commits the most blatant yellow card offensive seal World Cup, killing the ball, reducing the box to 14 men with just a minute and a half to play. I mean, I'm on the edge of my seat, just, just, I was on the edge of my seat just typing that, I've got it in my notes, and now I'm on the edge of my seat just reading this out, and I'll probably be on the edge of my seat just editing this, and I'm probably when I watch it back, just proper, proper edge of the seat stuff. Victor Matfield, as smart as Locke's ever got, runs down a few of those seconds by engaging before the ball is in. He knows what he's doing, he'll probably waste 15 of the remaining 35 seconds, and the box then holds up the Japanese drive, another 30 sliding by. This gives Japan a 5 metre scrum against 7 spring box. They smash it. It's a phenomenal scrum. Advantage given, Fori Priya takes no chances and dives on the ball to kill any chance of Japan playing. And then it happens. The moment. Maybe the most famous moment of captaincy in rugby union history. Eddie Jones in the stands is calling for the kick. Michael Leach opts for the scrum. The ball is in play. This is his team now. 
The shot at goal is gettable, with Goromaru kicking incredibly well all day. A draw would be an enormous result. And this is a bloody good Springboks team. All it takes is one knock-on or one turnover and the four-year dream is dead. Goliath has triumphed. Taking a draw is the easier option, the safer option. But Leach says no. Leach stands. The scrum is messy, but Maffey recovers. Leach himself hits a good line and begins Japan's momentum. Then this carry from Broadhurst is simply to reload, to reset, to get back into shape after the scrum, to get all 15 players into position. At this point, the South African defence is quite comfortable. They're in the usual shape. The 15-era box, defended with all seven forwards closest to the ruck, split over either side and the backs further out. It was a simple split that allowed for excellent support in most tackles over most of the pitch, meaning the defence was rarely spread thin. So if Japan are going to get anywhere, they have to disable this. Michael Leach very deliberately fires himself at the furthest out forward at the transition gap. However, two box work around the corner. Matfield here and low outside him. Tatakawa points this out. He screams, highlighting low. His work means Leach's carry hasn't yet disabled the defence, hasn't yet got rid of either of those two arms in the way they'd have hoped. Tatakawa orders Makabe, the next carrier, to hit low. Just carry into the exact same part of the defence Leach just did to go right at Francois slash Rob Lowe. One, anyone called Lowe. Just hit anyone called low. This does the trick. The ball is quick and South Africa now have all of their forwards on one side and only backs on the other. Tatakawa carries himself, splitting the two centres. Michael Leach works around the corner and carries for a third time in the move. Almost, almost making it to the line. And then it comes. Goromaru runs a fantastic dummy line. And Makabe is never getting the ball but continues to run as though he might. But from this reverse shot, just take a look at the numbers on the Springbok players' backs. They want their defensive line to be very straightforward. The quicker players further out, the stronger players closer in. With 12, hopefully, in the middle, about here, to marshal and meld the two together. Instead, defensive captain Jean de Villiers, the man who leads the line, that key man in the 12 jersey, is stood here. Jesse Creel has spread back to his usual position, but he was making this tackle on another part of the pitch just six seconds earlier, so hasn't had time to adjust and take in his surroundings properly, just to stand roughly where he should be. So he doesn't have time to work out how to shut down the coming attack. And the last forward out, which would normally be a back rower, so they have the pace to drift and cover, is instead a knackered tight head prop, now back onto the field because of Uster Hayes and yellow card. The box are scarcely aligned, and Japan made sure of this. And now all Japan have to do is execute. A great pass by Tadakawa allows Maffey time on the ball. He drifts, he fends Jesse Creel. Of Duplessis being the furthest forward out, only Pollard is able to get across. He has no support. And Japan have two men spare. Pollard just about makes it to Maffey, desperately trying to buy Peterson a second or so to get wider and mark Hesketh. But Pollard loses his footing, leaving JP Peterson with this picture. Seven metres from his own try line. Fifteen metres from the touch line and a bloody good finish of receiving the ball. It has to be. It has to be. It is. It almost takes a second to process. Japan are a side who could never win this game on paper. They are a side who have only ever won one Rugby World Cup match, and geography aside, South Africa could not be further from Zimbabwe. This was impossible. And yet, here it is, in front of you, happening. No wonder people called it a miracle. It's something logic tells you can't happen. And yet you can see the science. Japan have expertly split the spring box by contorting the defence into such a shape they can easily work their way outside it in three passes. It's superb. It's perfect, even. It's a new Japanese style of rugby, and it's perhaps the biggest upset in the history of sport. It's been five years since Hesker slid in that corner, and the match has now usurped both David and Goliath to become its own cliché. Now every upset in rugby is doing a Brighton, with its context being lost as Japan get better and better. It was the kind of win that didn't happen in rugby. And yet, at the same time, this result was rugby. We can break down every beat of the match and explain the logic and science and strategy behind them, but at the end of the day, I think the word miracle, loaded or otherwise, works. Because I choose to believe there is an element of magic to proceedings. 
Even for the Springboks, this loss just made their eventual destiny in the following World Cup all the sweeter. This was a day that said nothing in rugby is certain, that anybody can win any game, that anything can happen if you're willing to think, to play, to work for it. This was a match that was everything you could possibly want rugby to be. Inclusive, open and inspiring, thrilling, fresh and new, physical, fast and free thinking. Magic. It was a day that proved that rugby is a sport that's every bit for David as much as it is for Goliath. Hello, thank you for watching that through to the end. I recognise it is almost now between the two parts, uh, but this has been literally months of work. Uh, this has been hundreds of hours, I don't even think that's an exaggeration at all, several hundred, um, of work to go into this, so thank you very much for watching it. Um, I am now going to move on to the internationals that are happening right now. Again, again, there's internationals again. There was a fantastic game between the Wallabies and the All Blacks, so I'll be looking at that next. We've then also got the Premiership and the European Final. Um, those are coming up very soon, two games with Exeter. Um, and beyond that, again, this autumn tournament, all kinds of actual rugby um, that isn't from 2015. However, I want to go back, back even further... I've been doing a podcast on the 2011 Rugby World Cup. Um, we're over halfway through now. So there's an episode on each game. That's the idea. Um, and hopefully it's more fun, funnier and more entertaining than that sounds. There's some great guests on there. Please have a look at that. Have a look at everything else. And I will have a look at all of you, hopefully later this week, when I look at that fantastic game between the Wallabies and the All Blacks. Thank you very much. See you then. Psst, quickly. Full credit to Marley Sal for pointing at the line like there was any chance the occasion would get the better of Hescoff and he just, you know, jogged backwards towards an post. And even more so to Akito Yamada for having the goal to do a bit moments after taking part in such a historic contest and, you know, highlight of his career and potentially life and pretend his contact lenses had fallen out because he couldn't believe his eyes. But even more credit to this man. Daisuke Kimura, 62 years old still playing, has been to every World Cup with Japan, deserves to be known for the hero he is.